thank you all for getting here. Good evening. Uh, I'm Evan Berry, a faculty member in religious studies here at ASU and current president of the International Society for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Arizona State University for our 2023 conference, After Earth, Religion and Technology on a Changing Planet. We acknowledge that this conference is being held on the ancestral lands of indigenous nations. We would like to thank the native communities of the Salt River Valley, including the Akimel O'odham, the Pima, uh, and the Pipash, Maricopa Nations, who have inhabited this place for centuries and whose stewardship of the land and waterways allows us to be here today. We are committed to making sure that our collective efforts as a scholarly organization include Native voices and pursue solidarity with Native communities. The ISSRNC was founded nearly 20 years ago to create a space for scholars in the many fields of study interested in the intersections among religion, nature, and culture so that they could share their research in regular conferences and in a high quality peer review journal. This is now the society's 11th conference and uh, ASU now joins a, a list of hosting institutions that includes the University of Florida, the New School, Pepperdine University, the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Morelia, uh, the Vatican Museums, the University of Amsterdam, the University of Western Australia, and University College Cork in Ireland. We get around. The Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture is now in its 17th volume and remains a thriving multidisciplinary venue for scholarship in the environmental humanities and social sciences. For those of you new to ISSRNC conferences, I hope you will connect with us on social media and that we'll see you again in 2024. The theme for this uh, year's conference is After Earth, Religion and Technology on a Changing Planet, and it's a timely one. The public health crisis and social turbulence that followed in the wake of the novel coronavirus have underscored just how deeply enmeshed our lives are with technologies related to health, information, energy, transportation, and surveillance. Through our seemingly ever-expanding technological capabilities, human-induced changes uh, to the Earth system are now happening at an unprecedented rate, disrupting climate, igniting megafires, depleting natural resources, and triggering mass extinctions. And at the same time, we are witnessing renewed interest in space exploration and extra bodily aspirations. All of these changes are met with both religious zeal and spiritual malaise alike. The stakes of studying religion and technology could not be higher. This is clear to me in the police killing of Tyree Nichols, a brutality recorded on the body cameras of several police assailants and also on a camera called a sky cop affixed to a nearby light post. Video from these digital cameras uh, has circulated through the social media networks and news outlets uh, in, within which we spend all too much time. Confronting each of us with technologically mediated ethical questions about whether or not to watch, how to discuss these images with our children or our families, where to invest our energies in the pursuit of, of justice, Images of state violence directed at a young black man are cruelly too common in our digital culture. The raw facts of police violence are evidenced through such technologies, but we are also subtly and perpetually reshaped by our collective exposure to images of racialized violence. The connection between our bodies, our well-being, our youth, our surveillance technologies, and our technologies for societal transformation are highly unstable. I want to ask for a brief moment of silence to recognize this fragility and to honor the life of Mr. Nichols. Thank you. It's precisely these kinds of morally dense moments where technology and culture meet questions of justice and possible futures on which this conference is centered. Like life itself, technology is not static. It is an ever evolving feature of a world that we create and which reciprocally re uh, creates us. We endeavor to understand technological change as socially, religiously, and ecologically salient. These are issues suited to interdisciplinary exchange and best addressed together in sustained, humane dialogue. 
the threads of scholarship that weave together to make the ISSRNC the kind of intellectual community that it is are best woven together. After nearly four years without an in-person conference, we should take note of and be sure to properly enjoy being together, sharing meals, ideas, and sustaining the critical work we do in this vital corner of the academy. We are able to gather here in person at Arizona State University because of the hard work and generosity of many. I want to thank the ISSRNC Board of Directors uh, and its conference planning subcommittee for their work in soliciting the many great papers and panels that we'll hear over the next few days. Here at ASU, we thank the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, both for their material support of the conference, but also for the work of the staff in arranging many of the logistics. We're grateful to the support of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, to the Interplanetary Initiative, to the Institute of Humanities Research, to the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict. Outside sponsors, including Equinox Press and the Center for Religion and, and the Human at Indiana University, were also instrumental. Lisa Sedaris of UC Santa Barbara uh, was the intellectual architect for the conference theme, so we have her to thank for the seeing the connections among our disparate uh, lines of research. But a special portion of our gratitude should be reserved for Dr. Amanda Nichols, the ISSRNC treasurer, whose, art, uh, whose organizational acumen and extensive academic network have done so much to make uh, this conference one you will certainly enjoy. I'm grateful to all these persons and all these groups for for, uh, and look forward to celebrating their contributions over the coming few days. The agenda for the weekend is busy. We have two keynote lectures, two additional plenary sessions, uh, several dozen panel uh, and paper sessions, and uh, the conference will be capped by a field trip to Oak Flat, a site sacred to the Apache people, uh, about 70 miles east of here, where some conference attendees uh, on Sunday will hear from leaders of Apache Stronghold, a native organization working to defend this special place against a massive copper mining project. I invite all of you to carefully read through the conference program, uh, maybe the later this evening when you get back to your hotel, to make sure you get the most out of the After Earth conference. Note details about how to connect to the Wi-Fi in this room or when you're presenting, uh, how to tag us on social media, and how to navigate uh, campus, which is kind of big. Uh, before we begin our keynote lecture, I wanted to invite to the podium a couple of campus leaders uh, to share words of welcome and also to demonstrate the importance of environmental humanities here at ASU. So first, join me in welcoming the Dean of Humanities, Jeffrey Cohen. Thanks. Thanks so much, Evan. I, it was very inspiring to hear the urgency of this conference framed as you did. I'm so proud to be your colleague here. So I'm Jeffrey Cohen. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Arizona State University, and I'll give you a, a very brief welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our beautiful campus, as well as to this conference. Um, you're in a building called Old Main, if you just want to take a look at it for a second, look around the room. At one time, this building was all there was to ASU, and it's hard to believe given that Tempe is now the most densely populated city in Arizona. It's largely because of ASU's presence that this community has flourished. What is now known as ASU was founded in 1885 as the Territorial Normal School of Tempe. It was a teacher's college, and it was created before Arizona was a state. In 1958, the citizens of Arizona voted to create Arizona State University out of it. I think about this act of humane democracy a lot. In a state where we have a record of voting for some things that I wish we would not vote for, the fact that the citizens here came together and created a university and charged it with offering educational opportunities to as many people as possible I think inspires many of us who teach here today. Today, ASU is a large university with an ambitious mission. The humanities alone consist of three large interdisciplinary schools, 14 centers, about 4,000 humanities majors, 360 full-time faculty, and faculty like Evan, who you just heard from, your president and our esteemed colleague here. And they ask the most urgent questions of our day in ways that always cross disciplines. 
Our faculty were drawn to ASU for its charter, which declares that we must not be judged by whom we exclude, but by whom we include and how they succeed. Our mission is to create knowledge of social value and to hold doors open where too many institutions of higher education keep them tightly closed. With our inclusion ethos in mind, it's an honor to welcome you here today. I hope you'll take some time to wander the campus, tour some of the beautiful spaces that we've created for humanities study as well as interdisciplinary study. All of our buildings are open to you. I encourage you to look at Durham Hall where our languages and literatures are housed. If you have time, the School of Earth and Space Exploration has a meteorite collection and lots of really cool exhibits. Um, it's a great place to just wander around. I just want to finish by saying, like you, I believe that if the Earth is to have a future that we can call both humane and equitable, it will arrive only when we take seriously the entanglement of religion, nature, culture, technology, and justice. I look forward to learning together along with you. Thanks. And then I'd also like to invite Joan McGregor, uh, director of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, up to the podium. Okay. Well, welcome all. We're really, really glad to have you. And this is a really important topic, as I'm sure you're all aware. Oh. <laughs> Technology, yeah. Um, is that, maybe I need to step back. <laughs> This is the uh, interface with technology that can be dangerous. Um, so I'm just the interim director, just to be clear. Uh, but uh, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I met Evan a number of years ago now. I ran three uh, NEH summer institutes up in Flagstaff, month-long institutes on the topic of thinking about emerging notions of sustainability and through the humanities. And, and we brought together people like Bron Taylor came out and spent a week or two with us, and uh, I think on a couple of occasions. And uh, we just had a really amazing month of thinking about these kinds of topics with a rich array of um, faculty from uh, all the humanities. And it was, you know, a lot of magic happens when you do that. You hang out with people, smart people over a month and go for hikes and drink beer or wine and, and just uh, talk about these topics. So this is something that I'm really passionate about and, and in particular thinking about this idea of the interface of technology with humans and the, and the environment. And, you know, I, I often think about kind of, you know, what, you know what, what or who were included in the community of humans and who were excluded historically and, and then kind of, you know, what we think now, but all as we go forward, as we more and more interface with technology, what does that mean for, you know, who gets included, who gets excluded? Um, because if technology becomes part of what it is to define us as human, then there may be people who, again, be because of the kinds of inequities in the world, get excluded on those grounds. But I also worry, and I think probably many of you do too, that, you know, is, is, is you know, as technology takes us farther and farther away from the connections with nature and with, you know, wild places. I'm an old Aldo Leopold fan, as Ron knows. Uh, and, you know, like Leopold, I, I can't imagine living in a world without wild places and the importance of wilderness and nature to all of us. And, of course, nature to me is just being outside or being in a garden. Um, and so, you know, how does that, how does technology shape that for us. Um, we're going to have to spend a few hours tomorrow, that's the reason I can't come to the conference, um, looking at um, virtual reality as a teaching tool. But as, as virtual reality gets more and more ingrained, what will happen to people's experience of reality reality? I'm, I mean, I'm a philosopher, which I know that's even problematic to talk about reality, so I don't want to go too far there. But I mean, there is something, you know, I guess I'm enough of a sense of that there's something out there that's that's important for us to experience that may be you know, part of the kind of spiritual connection to nature. So anyway, these are all topics that I know you're going to be grappling with in the next few days and, and in your career. But, but thank you for doing that work because I, I'm concerned that you know, we, we often think about these questions in, in purely kind of materialist terms, in kind of reductivist terms, and we forget the kind of larger connection 
of, of us with, with the natural world. So again, thank you. And as Dean Cohen said, get out and enjoy our, our beautiful campus and the beautiful area that we're that we're in. So, um, and again, I'm hoping I can come to some things. Of my, tonight, I've got to go to a, a class, but um, I will try to pop in because this is stuff that's near and dear to my heart. So, again, welcome. So, the reason we're actually all in this room is uh, this fabulous keynote speaker we have this evening. Uh, Sylvester Johnson is Assistant Vice Provost for the Humanities and Executive Director of the Tech for Humanity Initiative at Virginia Tech. He is the Founding Director of the University's Center for Humanities, which supports humanities-focused research and humanistic approaches to the guidance of technology. Uh, Professor Johnson's research has examined religion, race, and empire in the Atlantic world, religion and sexuality, national security practices, and the impact of intelligent machines and human enhancement on human identity and race governance. He's the author of The Myth of Ham in 19th Century American Christianity, a study of race and religious hatred that won the American Academy of Religion's best uh, first book award. Uh, he's also, he also wrote African American Religions, 1500 to 2000, an award-winning interpretation of five centuries of democracy, colonialism, and freedom in the Atlantic world, uh, Professor Johnson also co-edited uh, The FBI and Religion, Faith and National Security Before and After 9-11, and Religion and U.S. Empire, Critical New Histories, which just came out this past year from NYU Press. He's also the founding co-editor of the Journal of Africana Religions. Professor Johnson uh, recently led an artificial intelligence project that developed uh, successfully a proof of concept machine learning application to take in and analyze humanities texts. He's currently producing a, digitally, a digital scholarly edition of Early English History of Global Religions and writing a book on human identity in an age of intelligent machines and human machine symbiosis. Please join me in welcoming him for his talk, uh, Future Humans, Post-Human Futures. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Barry, for the uh, kind introduction and also the generosity and uh, invitation to be here, your leadership of this very exciting society that is bridging uh, the study of these important connections between religion and culture and nature, understanding what are really rapidly becoming even more urgent questions and issues for all of us globally. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, all of those of you who have organized the series of events. It's a really exciting set of uh, topics and panels of conversations that you have curated uh, for today and the rest of this week into the weekend. And uh, I'm really honored to be invited to join you today. I'll be talking, of course, about uh, future humans, post-human futures. Uh, that post is the air, post is the air uh, with some sense of trying to problematize that. Animism, human engineering, and the life of things. And uh, just to try to summarize the different pieces of this talk, uh, I'll first show a couple of examples of different efforts that have been made in order uh, to provide medical therapies that change the way human bodies work. Uh, so that's a medical intervention. I'll give a couple of examples of those. I'll explain some of what that implies about uh, the trajectories in future ways of, of, uh, of changing humans. I'll be using the term design, okay? but changing humans, uh, not just for medical therapies, but for all kinds of reasons. And I'll talk about that in a couple of ways, uh, structurally and also functionally. Uh, I'll move to this question of the distinction uh, between people, humans, and, and non-human entities, and uh, look at some of the ways, uh, both intuitively and also in more expert ways, that that category of human exceptionalism, uh, with the critique of which is very familiar now, has been, has been problematized uh, 
but not to the point of discarding it. So I'll also try to give one example of why I, I would not say let's just get rid of the category of the human, but rather approach it with circumspection. And then I'll drill down a little bit into some of the history of animism, uh, which is a problematical term, like almost every term. Uh, and, and I'll try to explain a couple of insights from the different side. Of, so there's the, the set of intellectual traditions that put together the box called humanism, uh, excuse me, animism, and said, uh, this is a thing, and this is what it is. Uh, I'll try to look in and around that box and say, well, the whole project of saying there was something animism is, is not to be celebrated today, I don't think. But there were some things happening they were trying to explain that I think is very useful to consider, and that is uh, an epistemology of, of humans and non-humans. And I'll, I'll suggest that although there are different varieties of that, uh, that some iteration of that epistemology that, get, that got put inside the box called animism can be a useful lens if we think a few decades forward. And then I'll make some suggestions about uh, what I think might be some helpful takeaways to prepare for this future. And I don't, I don't mean that ineluctably. Oh, it's going to happen inevitably. I mean, no, I th think probabilistically speaking, uh, that certain things are pretty likely to take shape. And I'll make some suggestions from a public interest technology approach about how I think we might uh, leverage some of our abilities today to ensure that that future of humanity and, and non-human entities is one that is more desirable, more desirable than what might be some of the other outcomes. So some, some better possible futures. So that's the shape of what I'm going to try to do. And I'll ask a question uh, early on to try to uh, set up an answer at the end. And the early on question is, uh, given the, the proposition that humans in the future will be very different from us. Uh, how, how might be some important ways that we bring more ethical governance to those futures, not just for the sake of homo sapiens, but, but for all things and people, okay? And one of the threads running through this talk is this distinction, putative distinction, between people and things. Uh, now, uh, I will say I, I use the term human engineering. Uh, if you, I mean, ASU, I think you're, how many years you've been the most innovative university in America? What is it, like 500 years running? You know, you've, you've broken the record. But not even at ASU, I think, can you, do you have a major called human engineering? Not yet? Okay, it'll probably happen to you first. But right now, as of today, as of 2023 today in February, you can't, you can't major in human engineering. Uh, I actually think that's going to change. And it, it, it probably won't become a department or a school in academic institutions at first when it happens. I think it'll start out in biotech companies. Uh, but I do think it will become something that people try to get ready for as a professional enterprise. I actually think that'll be very good. So I direct the humanities centers. I'm supposed to think about ways to advance humanities. I actually think this is actually uh, going to be good for humanistic disciplines in the sense that it will continue what has been a trend, whereby some of the innovations that are happening in things that a lot of people think of as strictly technical is actually putting more pressure on the need to work at the human frontier of those things, at the humanistic frontier. And you read the papers any day about anything with technology, and it's more likely than not is probably on that human side, where people are talking about its impact, its design. Uh, lots of attention to AI. I'm going to say a little bit about AI, because no one can give a talk today without at least mentioning ChatGPT. <laughs> How are we grading our papers, after all? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention that. Uh, but I think. I think this human engineering is actually going to be far more difficult even than AI. And AI is presenting all kinds of, of challenges. It's not just a challenge. It's a set of opportunities, and it's very useful. Um, and so having said those things, I sort of give a couple of examples. 
Uh, this enterprise of changing, modifying people. So this is an image of David Bennett, who is, so he was the first person to have received a genetically, uh, a, a heart transplant from a pig that was a humanized pig. That is, the pig had been genetically engineered to be a, just a little bit less pig-like and a little bit more homo sapiens-like in the hope that this patient, David Bennett, who was uh, dying from end-stage heart failure, might receive a heart transplant from a pig that was a little bit less pig and a little bit more human okay? uh, without having the problem of organ rejection. Uh, this, was, of course, was not the first time that a non-human animal had been used to produce an organ transplant to a human. Some of you might remember Baby Faye from many, many, many decades ago, uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, that was before the internet <laughs> became a thing. And uh, Baby Faye was a young child who received a heart transplant from a baboon and lived only about three weeks before dying. David Bennett lived two months after this surgery. Uh, the FDA is, this is not approved. If you can't go to your doctor and say, I'd like to have a xenotransplantation from a humanized pig, he was in a very critical condition. He was going to die uh, very, really, really soon in a matter of days without this procedure. So the FDA did allow it on an emergency basis. Uh, a company named Revivacor, which is actually based, based in the place where I live now, Blacksburg, Virginia, specializes in creating and producing genetically modified pigs for this purpose. And pigs have overall a lot of genetic similarity already to humans, approximately 93%. Uh, but there are enough differences there that you can't just move an organ from a, a pig into a human without organ rejection. But this worked. There was sufficient genetic modification. And in the early days following this transplant, this was January of 2022, by the way, so a, a little bit over a year ago, uh, he seemed to be doing really well. The heart beat uh, a very... Uh, uh, very vigorously. In fact, the doctors were concerned it might be, he was so frail, the heart might be a little bit too vigorous for him. Uh, but that part turned out fine. He was also giving some medication to suppress his immune response uh, to try to ensure there was no organ rejection response because that's a big issue with these organ transplants. And he did not have organ rejection. Unfortunately, he died from a series of other complications. Uh, but just in terms of whether this heart that had been grown in a genetically modified, slightly humanized pig, whether that strategy could be a successful proof of concept, it was. And with the, with the aid of the immune suppressing drugs, in theory, this, this could have worked for even longer. And, and it created more investment in Revivacor. Uh, his family had two more months with him before he died. And so the doctors that performed this in Maryland uh, considered it at the level of proof of concept uh, to be successful even though there's lots of more work to be done before this becomes widely commercialized and gets approved. Uh, but the point is that with CRISPR-9 technology, it is possible to change a lot of things, to reshape lots of things at the genetic level, to create something from those cells that is by design different from what it would have been otherwise, and, and this is going to uh, this has been the case for agriculture, for other organic entities, not without controversy. We can talk about those problems. Uh, but in the case of humans, uh, this is going to very much be part of the future of humans and is part of the present. Uh, this slide just details a little bit what happened in that process. As I said, Revivacor is the company that specializes in producing genetically modified pigs. And so uh, from an adult, adult female pig, a cell is modified. In this case, they removed four genes that, uh, that would have made the heart tissue more likely to be rejected by this human patient. And then they added six genes uh, that would make it a little bit more human, okay? human-like. And those cells were used in culture. They were used to grow the pig. Uh, that was, of course, killed 
in order to remove the heart from it. And that's already something to talk about. Right? Why should pigs have to, or any other animal, non-human animals, have to die for humans to be able to live? Uh, one, one answer that people might give is that, well, every, every year, every day, in fact, uh, many humans die waiting for organ transplants. And uh, if they could receive an organ that had been grown, been grown in some entity that could be produced at mass scale, uh, would that not be worthwhile? His family certainly thought this was worthwhile, but others might say, well, you know, he should die. We, so we can chat about those things later, but my point is that this, this has already been happening, uh, both in agriculture uh, with biological humans, and I'll just add one more layer here, and that is uh, contrary to the, the misinformation campaigns, of course, the mRNA vaccines are not m modifying anyone's DNA. So I'm not trying to give life to that lie. It is not, okay? I just want to be clear from what I'm about to say. Uh, but the nanotechnology that has made possible those vaccines is an example of why biotechnology uh, has to be examined not, not only with this uh, disposition of all of its problems, but also with an understanding that we, we are currently living in a pandemic that has caused millions of people to die in this country alone, uh, well over a million who've died. And it's not over, 500 people a day are still dying, uh, but far fewer people have died because of uh, the technology that has gone in, in figuring out how to get human cellular systems to change the way they operate so that people might have a better chance of surviving. And so it's not just a kind of hypothetical thing. I'm talking about one person here, David Bennett. It's not an individual thing. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why the billions of dollars that are going into the research to make it possible to change humans and non-human entities at the genetic level and cellular level. There's lots of reasons why money's going into that. Uh, most of it is for-profit enterprises. We can talk about that as well in the Q&A. But that should not be a reason to, to elide the fact that we are talking about life and death, and particularly at, at scale here. So I think it's fair to say that human engineering will, will not be some fringe enterprise. Uh, in the same way, in fact, that the economies of scale, uh, that the diversity of implementations of machine intelligence, of AI applications, and the many forms that they come, have become integral to our lives in many different ways globally, uh, not for every single person, but globally for, for so much of humanity. In a similar kind of fashion, I think at a greater scale, however, uh, human engineering is going to radically transform not only how our societies operate, uh, but the kind of ethical strategies that need to be in place. Uh, so one of our introductory speakers is pointing to the question of who gets access to what. You know, this is very expensive technology. And, and so what kind of models need to be in place? But this is going to radically shape the future. And I think that for this reason, it's important to consider further that as we move two, three, four decades uh, from us, we are looking at populations of humans who by design are actually quite different from us. Okay. It's another example of modifying people. So you're looking at a, a sketch of a diagrammatical sketch of a cochlear implant. Uh, this is not radically new technology. It's by the standards of the pace of change in tech. Uh, it's not novel, basically. Cochlear implants have been around for many years. And they're used to restore hearing capacity uh, to people who have some, some scale of hearing loss. And it basically involves implanting uh, multiple devices. So you'll see in this diagram an electrode array that is around that, that cochlear, where the cochlear gland is. Uh, there's a microphone there. There's a receiver that's implanted right beneath the skin. So if you're just looking at someone who has a cochlear implant, it's like you can't see their cochlear gland, of course, if you look around the room, and you can't see the implant for that reason. But you, there might be some little scar or something from an incision, but there is a, a receiver that's right beneath the skin. 
And this device, interestingly, it, it, it does not literally replicate the experience of sound in the way that people experience that uh, with, um, I'm going to use the term natural, even though part of my point is that what that is is going to keep changing, but with a natural cochlear gland. Uh, but it, it, so what people hear with the cochlear implant is going to be different from what they would hear if they had a, func a fully functioning cochlear gland. But it does work well enough so that they can have conversations with people, they can navigate the world. Uh, there is a fascinating film that came out some decades ago called The Sound and the Fury. I don't know if any of you ever saw that, but it's about the impact that cochlear implants held and their promise to, in theory, completely eliminate deafness. And that film, The Sound and the Fury, it's, it's, I think you can watch it on YouTube now. You go and have an extra 90 minutes one weekend and type it in. Uh, it's about the response from the deaf community. Because if you completely eliminate deafness, you don't have a deaf community anymore. And that disability is not just a disability, it's an identity as well. Uh, so even something like this is not without controversy. But the point is that people have often and repeatedly desired to have some interventions in order to allow them to be able to navigate uh, with these disabilities so they can have restored capacities. And that has driven these types of technologies. So this is something that's not novel. Uh, there are many more novel examples that one could give, particularly with, with brain implants. This is, this, this has neural function, however. This is, this, this is not implanted into the brain, but it's already doing uh, the, it is interacting with and, uh, and providing electrical signaling as neural processing. It's already part of that ecosystem of what the brain is doing, even though it's not in the brain. And, and this was just one of the early instances that you could design something that could allow people to have neural processing that could restore capacity. And then the uh, DARPA got really aggressive and said, okay, let's do something even more sophisticated. And so the brain implants, uh, be, they began to proceed. So we're going to see more of those brain implants in the coming decades. And, and based on the research that, that DARPA has been funding for several years now, some of that will restore motor capacity, being able to walk again or move a limb again. Some of that would restore speech capacity. So those who have traumatic brain injury, who lose some of their speech function will have that. And some of it will, will restore the capacity for memory. Okay? So you, can, you can actually move memory between human cells and machine parts. And that's an interest that DARPA has in restoring capacity uh, for, for military personnel who've experienced injury and also for people who have not experienced any injury, but who just might be able to do something a little extra, or a lot of extra. Okay? But that, that medical intervention, I think it's fair to say, is what will mostly drive this, because there is a lot of, of ideological and political resistance to, well, I would just like to have two brains for the fun of it. And so if, you know, if I can afford it, I'll just go buy myself a little implant or a big implant, and then I can do twice as much uh, whatever the hectic things that Sylvester Johnson's up to. Uh, anyhow, it, it's more of what we're really driving is someone has really experienced something that's traumatizing, and they want restored capacity, and we have the ability to do it. And the ethics will largely begin to be driven by that. So 2050, you know, what does that look like? Uh, they will be very different from us. Now, when we think about uh, the implications of this technology, and I, I've already told you I'm going to get to the, the question of, well, can, can things do things? <laughs> What's the difference between uh, a person and a thing? Or, but first is this question of personhood. Uh, the question of personhood, of course, has been written about by many different authors in many different ways for a long time. Uh, the, the critique of human exceptionalism now is as old and familiar as almost, well, not quite as old as black pepper or drinking water, you know, but it's not too far behind. <laughs> if you talk about the critique of human exceptionalism now, uh, people usually don't blink. They say, yeah, 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 we know that. 
And, and the point behind that is that uh, the idea of personhood, which gets theorized in many different ways, but let's, let's just use some of the qualities that are often associated with it, the ability to feel pain, the ability to experience consciousness, self-awareness, experiencing emotion, experiencing intersubjective connection. So when your cat or dog looks up to you or greets you, it, uh, as if they've never seen you, for not your cat, but your dog, as if they haven't seen you in six months, that probably meant that you went outside for five minutes, right? You come back in and they're so happy to see you. What we give them credit for and what we can't prove is that, yeah, they recognize something, that there's a sense of connection. And, and uh, Pache, uh, uh, B.F. Skinner, who claimed that you can never go beyond observable, observable uh, physical activities, and, and enter the realm of intention or awareness, people say, no, I actually think my dog wants to see me, has some kind of relationship with me. And we do that to one another. So there's no way to prove that Sylvester Johnson is conscious, or anyone else for that matter. I'm, not, I'm no different from anybody else. But I experienced it for myself. I could never prove it to you. I have no, no objective way of doing that. None of us do. But we give one another a free pass. And then depending on the cultures or societal norms that we grew up with or become acquainted with, you know, we, we get more selective. And it's not all humans, uh, it, it's selective. And then when we leave the human realm, we get really selective. And, and so what is pictured here uh, is, a, is a photo of uh, Francine Patterson, who went by Penny Patterson, and a gorilla uh, named Coco that she trained from its infancy, and this was a rescued gorilla, she trained this uh, gorilla in a modified form of American Sign Language. So some of you may have heard about this. Uh, Coco was able to, to, look, to have a fairly extensive vocabulary, not the same as, as a human would with ASL, but enough to communicate very subtle things. For example, Coco told Penny that and Coco was a female gorilla, uh, that Coco wanted a pet kitten. And Penny was very reluctant to give this gorilla a, pen, uh, a kitten, not because she thought it would harm the kitten. By this time, she had had uh, years of relationship with Coco and knew that, you know, had conversations every day using this modified sign language and knew that uh, Coco could do very sophisticated things, but wasn't sure what she quite wanted to do with a kitten, but she kept communicating that she wanted a kitten for reasons of affection, connection, as a pet. And uh, she did eventually give her a kitten, and uh, Coco the gorilla formed an affectionate relationship with this kitten. But they did lots of other things. There was another gorilla, actually, that was trained uh, along with Coco, who, and Coco lived to be 46, which is in captivity, of course. Uh, not, not typically the case in the wild. Another gorilla that was also rescued and was also taught sign language began to communicate with Penny as well. And, and what Penny reported is that this other gorilla told her that its mother had been killed with some loud noises and that it felt very sad and still missed its mother. And it turned out that poachers had killed its mother. They shot this gorilla's mother, and the gorilla, according to Penny, was relaying a story of trauma that felt very sad and never recovered from that pain. There were lots of skeptics, you know, people who said, well, okay, we can see that these gorillas have learned some basic things, but they don't really know what they're saying. <laughs> it's like a parrot, you know, can a parrot talk? Of course. Does a parrot know what it's saying? You know, well, many experts would say not really. Uh, and so people made the same claim about the gorilla. But the point is that with, with Penny, and the relationships and the, particularly the ability to sign, to communicate very explicit things, it created a way for Penny to, to show the world a little bit of what we might call the interiority of a non-human animal. And, and many of you are well-versed in animals, non-human animal studies and know this is uh, something that's very familiar to experts. But that actually shifted a lot of the discourse about uh, human exceptionalism. So there, there, my point here is there, there are many different reasons why one might arrive at an understanding that personhood, the ability to experience those things, those qualities I just named earlier, things like experiencing pain or, or affection or connection or self-awareness, is by no means just a human phenomenon. 
Uh, but I don't mean to say that there is this hierarchy and if we go down low enough, there's nothing there. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but that, that is something that's very important to consider, that personhood exceeds the bounds of human identity. But I don't think that necessarily means, okay, I have to go back. I don't think that necessarily means that we have to discard the uh, very notion of the human or retreat into the claim that there's just, let's just get rid of the human and let's move on. So there is a slide and I, I'm not gonna waste time, too much time going back to it, uh, but I will try to get there. Because there's one person I like to mention whose work uh, became important for rethinking uh, this other topic that I have signal to you, I'll talk about this animism thing, okay? And it's, it's melodoma sine, but before we do that, uh, I think it's fair to recognize that the critique of human exceptionalism uh, doesn't necessarily mean that there are not substantive and, and figurative um, gains to be made and realities to be understood and appreciated through the understanding of the human, okay? And this is very debatable, okay? There are many who would say, let's just get rid of the term. Um, and and I'm, I'm not trying to be doctrinaire, I'm just trying to make one point of why it just becomes very complicated, even when we understand the limitations of the human in that category. So this is a picture of Odabenga, and Odabenga, uh, was a Congolese man who lived in the 1800s. I was born in the 1800s, and he died in 1916. Uh, he, was, he was enslaved. And in uh, West Central Africa, and he was purchased by a white missionary named uh, William Werner, who had been tasked with acquiring human beings from throughout Africa, bringing them to the United States so that they could be exhibited in the 1904 uh, Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And that took place in St. Louis, Missouri. And he had done many different, uh, Werner had done many different kinds of things, uh, but eventually he got interested in exploration and he became a fan of uh, David Livingstone and, and other of white explorers who had lived in different parts of Africa and had written about it and had been involved in a number of different colonial projects. So he, he eventually ends up in the Congo and he encounters Odabenga who had been banned from his society, from the Twa, and had been enslaved. And he brought him back to the United States. Odabenga uh, had a very terrible life in the U.S. He was supposed to have this life of freedom, but he ended up being placed in the Bronx Zoo uh, from 1904. He started out in this Louisiana Purchase Exposition, the fair. He was exhibited in the fair with primates. Okay. Then he was placed in the Bronx Zoo, and he was caged, often with an orangutan. And he lived in this cage, and people would come to see him. And African Americans at that time uh, made an appeal to New York City's mayor, who eventually forced the zoo to release Otabenga. And Otabenga moved to Lynchburg, Virginia. And he ended up living the rest of a, of a relatively short life there in Lynchburg, Virginia. He tried to go back to his home in Africa. And he, he did visit earlier before, uh, but he was not able to go back permanently to live. And, he, and then 1914, the First World War starts, and it made it impossible to, to travel across the Atlantic. And he eventually died uh, after suffering severe depression. He killed himself. He, he died of suicide in 1916. But his story is just one very, very small slice of a larger tapestry about the challenges of the category of, of the human and who gets to be recognized in humanity, who's part of civilization or not. And I'm not claiming, ergo, therefore, 
you'd better not touch this precious category of the human. <laughs> I've already rehearsed the critique of it. Right? I'm just saying that it's, it's, it's not as simple, I think, as saying, well, then we have no use for this category because it has no veridical uh, insight. It doesn't really tell us anything, and it has no political efficacy. I think it does have political efficacy. I think it matters for people's lives. There's something that the UN you know, Declaration of Human Rights in the 1940s did. That's also a problematic way of arguing for rights. I understand that. I'm just saying that in the decades to come, I don't think this category is going away. And I think if we look at the history of how the human has operated as a political kind of category, that there, there are both cautionary tales that show what is a problem with it. And there are also cautionary tales that reveal that not everyone is trying to gain recognition as human. And so it's, it's like being a citizen. You know, if you've never been stopped at the border, you've got you know, driver's license, passports, <laughs> these things coming out of your pockets. Uh, you might not really, you might write an essay, you know, why citizenship needs to be reconstructed. You know, we need something better. Uh, but if you're trying to get it, and if you experience the hyper vulnerability that comes with being stateless, citizenship doesn't seem like this terrible thing that we should probably get rid of. See? And even though it has all kinds of problems and it's fundamentally rooted in this violent binary. And so that's, I'm, I'm just wanting to pay attention to that. And so I'm, I want to move into uh, this question then. And I'm getting close to the end, so. <laughs> uh, I want to move into this question of this difference between people and things. And I want to do it by talking about this person, uh, Maladoma Patrice Somme, and one other example about the history of animism. And I'll circle back to that thing I said I'd talk about. You know, what should we be taking away? Right? What are we going to do over the next few decades? So Maladoma Patrice Somme uh, was uh, a very influential author and uh, healer um, who did several different things. So he was born in the 19, 1950s in the uh, Burkina Faso in uh, Central Africa. And his, his nation of people was the Dagara people. He ended up at age four being taken to a Jesuit missionary school where he lived until he was 20 years old and he was trained in their theological systems and they taught him that they had rescued him from this awful existence uh, that he should try to, that he should have been grateful for. But he eventually left that missionary school where he experienced a lot of abuse, physically and psychologically, made it back to his family. And at age 20, he was initiated. And that initiation was something that would have happened when he was much younger, probably around 13 or 14 years old. And after that initiation was over, uh, he, he gets his purpose in life from that, and he finds out all about these things that, according to this initiation tradition, he was supposed to learn. You know, what was his purpose in life? Uh, who was he before he was born? And what was he supposed to do? And he, he claimed he was supposed to be a friend to the enemy. And this is in the context of colonialism. So that meant the Western world that had actually imposed these colonial structures. So he eventually moves to, to France. He does a PhD at the Sorbonne. He moves to, Brand, to the US, does a PhD at Brandeis. He writes lots of things. He gives lots of workshops. And he understood himself to be a translator between these very different kinds of culture. Uh, but that's not, that's not the point of my story, or his story. In one of his influential works of Water and the Spirit, uh, which is a really fabulous read, it's, it's, it's very much a memoir in which he's talking about different things. is beautifully written. He talks about some of the practices of the Dagara. And he says that one of the things that they do, so they have um, many different medicines that they make using botanics, botanical knowledge. And he says that when they needed to, to create some medicinal compound, they would actually ask the plants about the botanical properties of the plant. And he said, you know, we, can, we, can, we know how to communicate with the plants. And I'm not, I'm not even invested in whether or not that really happened. You can, you can accept that or not. <laughs> to me, that's not the point. Uh, but he said they communicate with the plants. And they're able to create all of these different drugs without 
extensive mammoth pharmaceutical factories where they're testing all these. They just get the knowledge of the properties, he said, directly from the plants. And they communicate with other entities as well. And, and it, you know, it's in the book. It's like all kinds of things. Going on. And he said that uh, by doing that, they're able to address different kinds of needs. And so this, this idea of communing, not just with nature, and I have it here, which is problematic, but as part of it, is very integral to his story and to what the Dagara were doing. And one of the things that he, he wanted to, uh, quote unquote, teach the West. And I'm not trying to set up a dichotomy that's already been set up by colonialism, <laughs> so I didn't do that. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point about uh, the, the epistemes that might inform how we go forward. Okay? So one of the points is that the access to or implementation of botanical knowledge for the practice of medicine, of course, that goes on everywhere. And it's, it's very much a part of all of these things going forward. But the, the communion with nature and the idea that, that knowledge, that intelligence, is not only not just a human phenomenon, it's not just human, it's also not just an animal phenomenon, but it's also a, a botanical or a plant-based phenomenon, that the plants know things. Like that's, that's embedded in this approach, in that understanding. And so it's not that there's no differences between humans and cats, although he claims that they can, sh they can shift from one to the other, that some humans can become, they can take the form of a cat. And that there's no differences between cats and trees. I think there are differences. But the differences are not rooted in some fundamental ontology that would preclude plants from knowing things or even communicating. So uh, if you get a chance, it's really worth reading this story. Uh, but what Somme embodies, I think, is, and what he represents is one particular iteration of a much grander tradition that's just part of many different varieties of how people throughout the world have tried to understand this question. What is personhood? What is nature? What are we doing as people? And even understanding that within the context of religious systems. So during the, uh, during the 1400s, this is a woodcut that I wanted to show you, and I'll try to get to it again. During the 1400s, uh, of course, what, one of the important global phenomena that emerges is the structuring of trade between uh, West Central African states and European states. And there's a woodcut that you've seen pass by the slide deck a couple of times. So I'll see if I can get the clicker to go back to it. And that woodcut uh, was made a couple of centuries after the period that it represents. But it's depicting the 1400s encounter between uh, some merchants from uh, from Iberia and the royal court in the Congolese state, and so there you see these these missionaries from Iberia, merchants and missionaries who are paying respects, paying homage to this Congolese monarch who's there on your left, and that that was very significant. So that's the late 1400s, and what happened. In that period, uh, the, Con the Congolese Empire adopted Catholicism as its state religion. And they did that in the very complex kind of synthesis. It was not banning everything else at first. Uh, later on, it created huge religious conflicts. But at the time, it, it was a great way to set up trade. And it was sort of like uh, an opportunity to immerse the households of the elite in this very interesting kind of thing called Christianity. Uh, it was something that elite people did. You know, it was just very curious and interesting. One of the, the things that happens in that encounter, however, in the, in the late 1400s and into the 1500s, is the creation among European observers, intellectuals, of what they would call uh, the, the religion of the blacks. Okay? And uh, Charles de Brosse is one of those authors who would write about this later in the 1600s. Uh, his, his work would become very influential for a number of figures. But when they said the religion of the blacks, and this would kind of be called by different things, the religion of the fetish is sometimes what it would be called, or fetishism, or animism. Okay? 
uh, that, that way of talking about religion was really the first time that we have something that's called black religion, the religion of the blacks. And it was rooted in this fascination with the idea that these peoples in West Central Africa attributed to things, to non-living entities, the capacities to feel, to think, to know, that they just took for granted with humans, okay? that Europeans took for granted. With. And anyone who's studied the history of Europe in this period know there is no one epistemology in Europe. I remember people are being targeted for things like witchcraft, for example, that's what it was being called. Uh, they're being put to death for claiming that things could do all kinds of things. Uh, so there's not like everybody in Europe thought the same way. That's why people were being killed and they were being persecuted. There was actually quite a bit of diversity in what people thought. Uh, the real difference in the contrast between these European states and West Central African states was whether it was legitimate among the elites and the powerful to hold that understanding. And it was legitimate in the Congo, in, in the Congo Kingdom to understand that these different kinds of entities had the ability to know, they had the ability to feel, they had the ability to think. And not only that, but people understood and continue to understand their constitution as humans in a hybrid sense. So what, what Europeans were fond of calling the fetish, which could refer to any number of things, and today means something uh, quite extensive, you think of kinky or something like that, began with this fascination with the derivation of the Iberian term uh, for or Portuguese, so there was no Portugal per se, but the Portuguese term for witchcraft, feitiçaria, is what they were using in Europe. And so the fetish was based on feitiçaria. And the idea was that in among these West Central African populations is that you could, you could create something, you could manufacture something. And so this is an image of one of those objects. Okay? And when you, when you made it, even though you made it, what you produced had a, t a kind of capacity that was beyond you, even though you were the maker. It, it had a kind of existence that might have a connection to you. And, and particularly, if you went through something like an initiation, okay, even though it was outside of you, you might put it on and wear it. It could be a bracelet, it could be a necklace, it could be something else. You were now um, hybrid. This is part of you. This thing okay, is part you, even though you manufactured it. And for elite European observers who wrote about it, they condemned this. They said, well, this is foolishness. This is childish. This proves that the Africans deserve to be enslaved because you know, they, they're not intelligent. Not all Europeans thought that. Remember, people were being put to death because they were claiming that things could do things, all right? But among the elites, it was condemned. And that's how we get this construction of the category of animism as the religion of the blacks, and then more extensively, because Western colonialism is a global phenomenon, you know, it's in Australia, it's in uh, South Asia, it's, it's the, in the Americas, it's the religion of the primitives. And how do you know a primitive race? Well, many ways, but one way you can tell according to this colonial discourse, one way that you can tell primitives is that they think that things can do things. They think that things can know things. They think that things have personhood. Okay. But if, so that's the box, and I told you I wanted to sort of look inside, but also outside and around it. So it's, it's not that everyone throughout Europe thought the same thing. There, there are many different traditions. And, and if you're very strict about it, you just can't divide the world into, well, this population all thinks this way about materiality. And that population thinks another way. But that doesn't mean that there are no macro differences either. I've told you one of them was the question of what was a legitimate epistemology. Right? So this held legitimacy. This way of thinking held legitimacy in these West Central African states. But there was also more subtlety to it. When it's legitimate and people are writing about it and they're elaborating on it and they're building institutions, you know, it becomes a very complex thing if you're not being killed <laughs> while you have this way of understanding. When you can just exercise it, it can, it can grow and it can become 
quite sophisticated because it's not under pressure. And so there are many different examples of what is generally a more capacious understanding of those qualities that we have attached to the label of personhood. Remember, you know, sentience, thought, understanding, connection, the feeling of pain, affect, all those things. Uh, there, there are global traditions about that, and this was one iteration, okay? But this is a, a type of classic thing. It's all over the world, doesn't belong only to one part, even though there are macro differences, and people have fought about it for a long time, and we're gonna keep fighting about it. It is interesting to observe, however, so I told you I would mention, I can't, you can't give a talk now without mentioning ChatGPT, so here's my 60 second mention. <laughs> of ChatGPT, and then we'll move on. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm done. This is my next to the last slide, so be of good cheer. That one of, so ChatGPT, if you've not gotten on this thing, and if you get an extra 20 minutes on the weekend, you know, go while you're watching kittens on YouTube, just, you know, do five minutes to openai.org, dot com, excuse me, and see, see their ChatGPT, just throw some questions in there. So Jack, ChatGPT is a, is a very elaborate chatbot. It, it uses software that, or it is software that is largely predictive software. And I'll give you an example of it. Happy birthday to, and you're probably thinking of the word Y-O-U. Now, I could have been saying happy birthday to my son, you know, who had a birthday not too long ago. Uh, you, you don't know what word I'm going to say next, but you've seen that so many times or heard it, you know, you just go somewhere with it. You say you. Or, uh, you know, you can think of, of any other kind of thing like that. Why did the chicken cross the, and you might think road, because you're just so familiar with that. And so that software is basically, it's predicting what, what text or string of text comes after others. And it does that based on a data training set called a large language model. So you throw the, all the stuff that's on the internet at it, or much of the stuff that's on the internet, not everything, but much of it. And you get something like this. That's, that's a woefully simplified explanation of it, but I said 60 seconds, right? And because it's predictive in that way, what many experts have quickly pointed to, because if you haven't tried it, it's hard to explain, but basically you can ask it any kind of questions, and I was going to put some up here, but you know, I need to get done quickly because we're, we're almost at time. But you can ask it very sophisticated. You can ask it for a business plan. You can say, you know, write a business plan for uh, marketing bicycles that also have wings, and I want it to be for butterflies and CEOs in healthcare which is ridiculous, right? but it'll do it. I mean, it just, the, the ability to just take almost anything and come up with something, and if you read the business plan, you're like, wow, this is pretty, yeah, I should try this, I'm gonna quit my day job. It was actually pretty compelling. But, but experts have said, well, this, it doesn't actually know anything. It doesn't actually know anything. It's just trying to do that predictive thing. And uh, so that's the chat. Okay, so I'm, I'm not, I, I could almost, say I'm gonna try to contest that and say maybe it doesn't, but that's actually not my point. Because when, when they're saying that it's predictive and what it's doing is acknowledged, it, they're right that it's predictive. It's just predicting something. Just like you don't know what I'm gonna say when I say happy birthday to. You know, you're just, you've heard it so much, you just, ah, surely he's gonna say. But you're not reading my mind. You don't actually know <laughs> what I'm thinking, you see. You're just doing that little predictive thing. It's just based on what you're used to, that's all it is. And so, uh, you know, that point is correct as a technical correct. Uh, techno point. The future, however, the future of humanity and non-humanity is definitely going to be different. It's going to be modified. It's going to be engineered to be different. Not everybody's going to be able to afford it unless we structure it that way. Um, you know, sort of like saying not everybody has health care unless we allow them to. Right? <laughs> if we allow them to afford it, then we will. But if we don't allow them to afford it, they won't be. So we're going we're gonna to make that decision. Okay? But it's not inherent in the thing. It's just a decision that we're going to make. Right? And, and that when people do things, uh, as modified people, whether they're like those early images that I showed you, it's more structural. You have an implant, or, or your cells have been shaped differently, or your DNA's been redone. Or it's functional. So functional is you're riding now with 
chat GPT. And maybe you don't want your students to do it because, you know, it messes everything, messes up everything for you because they're supposed to be grading their writing, you know, they're actually supposed to do the writing. But if you're doing something else, you might actually find it useful to have someone creating some copy that then gets used for something else uh, or to move something over to a different language. But the point is that this is going to become part of how we work just as spell check is already part of how we write or just as other kinds of checks and balances are part of how we operate financially. Our software does our taxes for us. But when you send it to the IRS, they don't charge you with fraud and say, well, you didn't do these taxes, your software did. You know, they just accept it, right? They just, in fact, they probably don't want you to do it without the machines. They'd probably rather have, they're definitely, I want to have the machines there. But it doesn't automatically mean fraud, it just depends. But they had to change that. There was a time when people didn't want uh, engineering students to use calculators. and with the slide rule, right? And what we found out is that the calculators did not destroy engineering. It will be different. But not every epistemology will take us equally to where we need to go. And so I just want to end with this point that uh, what we have to, I, I will say, and you know, it's debatable because no one knows the future, but I will say what, what we should be doing, I'll put it that way, what we should be doing is getting ready for a sort of basic kind of future, one where people would be very different, non-human entities will be very different, our food is going to be different, our ability to resist disease is going to be different, all kinds of things. And I don't mean that in a glorified way. I don't mean that in the sense that, oh, and life is going to be wonderful. I actually, I actually think it, this, will be, this will be truly devastating uh, for most people who will be left out of things and who will be harmed by extraordinary capacities to be harmful. If we don't get ready, and when I say we, I'm being selective. I don't mean people who want to do harm, okay? So I'm not talking about you. I mean the people who actually want to mitigate harm. And they want more shared prosperity. More, they want more participation in, in good outcomes, in wholeness. And, and I think those different pillars that we have to work on is in, you know, we, we, we should continue to do the kinds of things we do. We're studying these problems, we're trying to figure out things. We have to invest in the future of talent, right? meaning, so what this conference is putting together. You know, we need people who, who can expertly move across trajectories of religion. They understand its role in shaping culture, and they understand the whole idea of nature is not a given, and that there is no nature out there that's... Uh, in, without any kind of expectation of how it looks, because we might already be in it, for example. <laughs> we, might, we, we might already be part of it. It depends. But the future talent that's going to be needed to guide that future needs to be different from what we've been producing. It, except for ASU, you know, you're doing all this amazing, innovative, you're, you're putting things together, you're running across the intersections, right? Uh, but most of us are, are so afraid and I direct a humanity center, okay? So I can tell you because I talk to other humanity directors all the time and we show up in our wagons and we circle them and we say, how are we going to save humanities? I'm just kidding. We don't circle wagons. But, but we, not literally, but we do recognize that we have to figure out how to advocate for things. And so uh, that's very important to consider. But we should not be so defensive that we don't figure out how to become the next version of what we need to be. So that we, those of us, again, if you want to do harm, I'm not talking to you. But those of us who want to mitigate harm, so that we actually become architects of the next three and five decades. We need hybrid economies. And that's complicated, but, but the, the, the shortcut of what I mean by that is that there is nothing inherent to innovation and technology. And people are going to want to, I mean, this would be a great topic for us to debate. <laughs> That, that makes it unequal. Inequality is our fault. It's what we're deciding as a society. It's not inherent to innovation or to new things. It's what we're doing with what we have. Because inequality is not new. I mean, tell me the year you want to look at, and we can go there, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. <laughs> It's not like it didn't exist in the past and now we got all these newfangled technologies and now we have inequality. You know, it's, it's, what, it's, a, it's a human project. That's what it is. If you want to find out the source of inequality, it's us. 
not technology. And there's a way to do this that gets us the outcomes that we need. Uh, episteme of nature, so what do we think nature is? And, and what kind of epistemology are we going to use as we go into that future? If we are already getting information from fungi, from plants, I was, I was just talking to Professor Barry the other day of all the things I'm learning from my 15-year-old son who's, a, who's a studying mycology. And uh, you know, he told me, people are studying the fungi because fungi have evolved for so many millions of years to fight viruses. And so if you study what they do, you can actually learn from them. And people do that. They might not say that the, vi that the fungi knows anything. Uh, Maladoma Sumay would say, of course they know things. That's, that's how you can learn from them. But, you know, talk about that. But the episteme is going to be very important. And finally, uh, how do you govern technology? What, what do you have to put in place? And so those are things that we, these, these are some of the things that need to happen now so that we are, we're not only in the mode of trying to understand possibilities, but we start to become architects. And I'm not saying everybody has to go out and, you know, we're going to shape the future. You know, people need to do different things. But some of us, and again, you know, if you want to do harm, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people who want to mitigate harm. But some of us need to want to build things and to have control, not in a totalizing way, but in a in positive influence way, on what happens in the coming generations, because decisions are going to get made. And we need to not just talk about the possibilities, but, but structure some of those things. I want to thank you very much again for this invitation. Uh, it's been an honor to really be here with you, and a delightful we could be in person. Uh, thank you also for your, your kind attention and would love to hear any disagreements, challenges, or other questions you may have, or comments, responses. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, uh, Andrew. It was a great question, and I'll try to summarize, make sure everyone heard, is, is this future that I'm imagining fundamentally different from our present, which is radically unequal? And let's say we invest in future talent. Okay? So this talent gets, uh, I'm, I'm trying to summarize, it's hired by the wealthiest companies uh, to help them do their thing. So probably, it, how do we know it will even make a difference? And then does that not mean there first must be social activism to change structures and systems so that there is at least a possibility of, of a different kind of future? Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, it, is, it is certainly possible that regardless of what we do, it will not work and we will get more inequality. And is, is this, say 2050, because you know it's a round number. It's 2050 fundamentally different from today. Um, so I, I, I think the, the quick answer is more in terms of scale. However, I, I don't want to I don't want to pay. I don't want to say that the difference 
to do this kind of engineering is just another thing. Okay? So I think it could be I could I think it could be something in addition to more than just a difference in degree. Not necessarily. And I think that if you have enough of a difference in degree, you, you actually have a different kind of thing. Even though at first you might measure it only in differences in degree. And an example of what I mean by that is that there, uh, there, there, so we live in a society in the US where there's a, there's a lot of inequality, but there's also enough of, a, of a, an ability to participate, in, and I'm not even talking about middle classness, but in a kind of viable life that it's easy to see when you travel globally. Right, so if you go to Haiti, one of the poorest nations in the world, there's inequality there and there's inequality in the United States. Now, I would want to say that you could say the difference is in scale, right? There's poverty and then people or the nations are more poor than others. But I also think that at a certain point, when you go so far in, in scale or in degree, you actually have a different kind of thing. You know, you can have a situation where you're, you have so much inequality, for example, that you're, you can't have any functioning public institutions. So even though if you look at US Congress today, you might say <laughs> public institutions not functioning because they, all they do is disagree. Uh, we you know, go to another country that's very poor and come back to the United States. And, and you'll see, well, there are things that work that we, it's easy to take for granted. You know, we have uh, federal agencies that make sure our water is drinkable, for, and it, for the most part, we're so kinds of things, right? I don't, I don't want to be long-winded. So it could be different. And then the, your point about capitalism, yeah, so when I say hybrid economies, uh, this is, you know, you don't have to believe any of this, of course. You're all academics, right? We, one of the things we learn to do is not accept what other people say, <laughs> learn, to, learn to argue, disagree with them. Uh, but for what it's worth, I've become more convinced there, the, there is nothing inherent to technology that creates an equality. I think, I think we're creating the equality. And it could be with anything. We, I, we can do it with education, because that's what we've done. We can do it with uh, transportation, because that's what we've done. <laughs> like, name your thing. We've done it with healthcare. Ah, oh, inequality. I mean, you, we, we would do it with all kinds of agriculture, inequality. So I think that we can structure different ways. And the shorthand way of saying this, in the United States, some nations have hybrid economies. Uh, Norway has a more hybridized kind of thing. Uh, United, in the United States, with rare exceptions, we don't allow public institutions to profiteer. All they can do is try to get, they, they can't directly generate revenue. Other, other private capital can generate revenue. And you're left with taxation. That's it. And private gifts, you know, uh, philanthropy. But other nations like Norway and Saudi Arabia, they, they have, Saudi Arabia has a sovereign wealth fund. And the government profiteers. And they use those profits to get pay, pay people a, a universal basic income who are citizens. If you're not a citizen, you can't get it. And Saudi Arabia is extremely uh, draconian with their citizenship laws. In the US, we're not innocent, okay? <laughs> but there is a difference, but we're not innocent either. And so when I say hybrid economies, uh, that's part of what I'm talking about, that we don't, we, we have made it impossible for public to profiteer. And we've created a particular kind of difficulty that could mean that the U.S. might not get through the rest of this century uh, with that basic kind of functioning. But I, but I, but I do acknowledge a point, this could all fail. But I think we need to try, and I think we need to try some different things, and activism absolutely has to be part of it. Our microphones have disappeared, and so I, I have one. Hello. Oh. Um, hi, Sylvester. Uh, it's Charlie McCrary Charlie. from ASU. Um, I wanted to, I kind of want to follow up on Andrew's question a little bit, um, just to ask more specifically about race and racialization. Um, in this kind of human, post-human future, um, and specifically along these lines, the processes of creating and deepening inequality that you're talking about 
to what extent will they be racialized and what exactly is the role of racialization as a process in some of these kind of post-human futures? And, and you, mean, you touched on this a little bit, so I'm wondering um, if you could talk more explicitly some of the stuff on Otabanga and the Congo Kingdom mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the fetish and the way that these lines are kind of drawn between human and non-human in racializing ways. How did those structures endure or not endure as we move into some kind of post-humanity? Yeah, this is a great question because the, the Derek Bell was one of the important uh, scholars in critical legal studies that gave what, what is actually critical race theory. Not everything is critical race theory. You know, everything has been called critical race theory today. <laughs> Uh, but not everything is critical race theory. But but what he was doing was critical race theory. But one of his his points was that racism. He he argued he doesn't know this. He's just he's making an argument. Is is permanent? That is never going away. And he didn't think it was go never going to go away because it was impossible. He was just trying to predict human behavior. Right. Saying it's, it's gonna it's not going to go away because people won't do what they should do to make it go away. And if he's right. Uh, what he was saying is that so we need to structure some other kind of things and put them in place so that even though there's some racism there, that it is significantly mitigated. Okay. Uh, what I, I, if you ask me about 2050, if, if I think racism would be gone, I will say absolutely not. Uh, if you ask me, well, could it could it be significantly mitigated? I would say it, it possibly. So I'm I'm not one of those who says that. Um, we're, we're never going to do things differently and that we're never going to fix these problems. Because I, even though if you, t you know me, Charlie, so you, you probably say, if I've read your book, Sylvester, of course, that's pretty much what you're saying. <laughs> so no, I, I've described the past. Uh, I, I like to say I'm an analytical pessimist. I like to try to understand how bad things really are, but an operational optimist. I like to say that we should live as if we can actually change things. And I say that largely because other people did and I benefit from it. And it's not that they eradicated everything, but I'm benefiting from things that they changed. So I don't think we'll eradicate racism by 2050. I don't think it'll go away. I think that a lot of these changes could actually reinscribe the racism. And I think a great example of that is Henrietta Lacks. If you look at, if you want to understand uh, some of the possible histories of human engineering, let's look at the past and and what happened with her. Her cells never died; they just kept living. So it, made, it became possible to do research in biotech because of her cells that led to genetic engineering, okay? And, and she never benefited from that, and her family never benefited from that, and racial inequality, she was a black woman, and racial inequality has increased. So it's possible that that can continue, uh, but it's also possible to structure it differently. And um, I don't want to ramble, so do you want to sharpen that question, or should we go into another and we talk some more? But, but what does it mean? We could do more racialization with this. The new humans, could become another race, for example. Yeah. Thank you for, okay. Okay. Thank you for such a great keynote, Dr. Johnson. Um, so my name is Avila J. Tyson. I'm a PhD student here at Arizona State, and I'm also the book reviews coordinator for the JSRNC. So a lot of you have probably heard my name. <laughs> um, so my question is, you mentioned some briefly about the Mansome who became initiated in a tradition in which he learned about the medicinal properties of plants from plants himself. Mm -hmm. um, could you please clarify and elaborate on what tradition he was initiated in? Yeah, the Dagara, it's D-A-G-A-R-A. And that is in West Central Africa, uh, Burkina Faso. And they, uh, yeah, so they, they did that initiation and he, he writes his story and he says that he learned to do all these things during his initiation. I'm not investing in the claim per se, uh, but I'm also not rejecting the claim. I'm just making the point that it's, it's rooted in this understanding that intelligence, that knowledge, and that communion is something that is a trans, trans species doesn't seem to go far enough. But, you know, it's, it's distributed across things and people. And it's not just a human thing. And it's not just an animal thing. Sorry. <laughs> oh. 
would like to invite you to speak more about what you meant when you said the human is a complex category. But we should. We shouldn't care. You can just go ahead and yell, and then I'll. Hear. <laughs> Or my bi human microbiome biologists say, you've never been human. You've always had these kind of uh, microorganisms inside of you. Yes, it moves. yes. So what do you mean when you say we keep it? Yes, uh, so what, what, do we, what do I mean when we say we're human? Uh, so how many minutes do we have left? We have four minutes left again. So I, I, I mean some of that, the, the quick move is to the species, to the species. But as, you're, as you just pointed out with the microbiome, uh, one of the important things that we've learned from the scientific research into biological systems is that there, there is no strict homogeneity in any systems. Uh, that we are all a product of very complex forms of evolution. But I mean, if you just take, the, if you take that species approach, and if you take that, that political side of it particularly, then I would say that these populations of people who are filled with bacteria uh, that actually we've evolved to require and live symbiotically with, that they're part of something that's in this political category. And, and what do we gain by that? Uh, so that's why I said that I, I gave the UN Declaration of Human Rights as an example uh, that that there are populations of people who continue to be denied basic kind of rights. And there is a, there is a problem with basing a movement for rights on that category of the human. Because it, it makes an appeal to a, a distinction that is already infused with a lot of injustices, and I realize that, okay? But that does not, for me, mean that I'm going to oppose human rights movements. I still support them. And I think one way of getting to the question is when, when you're trying to advance the interests of populations of people who are caught up in in systems of violence. I was going to say political violence, but it's going to imply as there's violence is not political. And someone will say, well, yeah, but all of it is ultimately political. Then it, I don't want to say the, the question of what counts as human recedes into the background. It, I don't think it should. But I think there's an operational side to this. And I think there's a much more nuanced side. What I don't want to do is examine uh, the abuses that happen in carceral systems, for example, and say, well, you know, this whole human thing is so complicated, I, I can't support your movement because you're, you're claiming it's a human rights movement. I'm going to support that movement. And someone will accuse me of participating in the violence of the category of the human. <laughs> and I'll say, well, if supporting human rights for people who are being tortured in U.S. prisons makes me a participant in some kind of thing, that's, that's going to be a cost of me supporting something I think I should support. I think there's an operational way to approach that, and then I think there's a, a, a discursive way, a theoretical way to approach it, and I don't think they're ever going to sit well with each other, and I'm perfectly fine with that. But I, but I think we still have to reckon with the problems of the category because as we move forward, it's going to become more difficult, especially to deal with this human engineering stuff if we don't deal with the problem of the human. And just kind of throw it out there, you know, what happens when you keep humanizing these pigs? And I don't think you have to humanize pigs to, to owe something ethical to pigs. I'm not making that claim. But it's not going to become easier when you keep humanizing them. That's a great place to wrap up. We have plenty of room for discussion and stuff, but that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.